today I have a dear friend, old friend, not old in that he's old, old that we go back a long ways, and a legend in the hunting industry, Brad Harris from Missouri. Brad, thanks for joining us for Deer Talk Now. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me on. It's been quite a while, my friend. How have you been? I have been good. i uh getting old and, and loving life. Uh, just been good all the way around. Been good. I see you've got some more additions to your wall there, some deer and uh, elk. Well, yeah, there's there's quite a bit of stuff in here. A lot of, a lot of years of memories. A lot of memories. And uh, Brad and I go back all the way to when I started here at Deer and Deer Hunting almost 30 years ago. Can you believe that? Uh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's been a long time. Long time. So um, if you don't know Brad, um, he has had so much experience in this industry. He came up um, with, if you remember, Loman Game Calls, one of the most iconic brands in the hunting industry. Brad actually invented the grunt tube. We're going to talk about that today. Um, we're also going to talk about old school hunting tactics. But Brad, I know that uh, you kind of came on before all this stuff was popular and also... Um, I don't know if you're the longest running uh, pro staffer for Real Tree, but you're right up there with all those guys. And I think uh, I've been involved with Bill Jordan and Real Tree for heck since I believe 1987. I mean, such a great company, and Bill and I became good friends. And it's just been a blessing to know him and uh, see what he's done in the hunting industry. Uh, he certainly made the designer camo very popular. But yeah, I came up a long time ago with Loman and. Kind of got started in the old turkey calling industry back in the late 70s. And uh, that kind of led to the calling can kind of led to uh, into the opportunity to work in the call industry. And my gosh, it just took off from there. And it really did. And, you know, I'm back then. No, I, you know, I know if we go back all the way to Native American times, I know people were calling deer in, but nobody was doing it really in the, I guess, called modern era. Um, tell us that story. I was going to save it, but it's such a fascinating story. How did you come up with that idea? Well, obviously, uh, my passion for bow hunting back then in the seventies was, was, uh, powerful. I mean, I loved it. Uh, using old Shakespeare recurve and my goodness, it, you know, made so many mistakes, didn't have a clue what we were doing. But one thing I figured out real quick is I needed animals really close. And uh, so my, my theory was always trying to figure out how to get, regardless what I was hunting, that animal close. And uh, my grandfather taught me to call squirrels when I was a little boy. And I realized that, man, if I can fool a squirrel and get him a little bit closer or get him to expose himself, I bag more squirrels. Well, then turkey hunting came along and it's like, hey, will you call that hen? You get that gobbler in close, makes for a great hunt. And uh, in the tree stand hunting whitetails, it was so frustrating hunting with a recurve, and my shots were limited to about 20 yards. I mean, that's that was my limitation. Not much different today either. I'm still a, a close-in shooter. And uh, it's like, man, I'd have bucks or not bucks, does, deer, something with hair on it. And it'd be 35, 40, 50, 70 yards and just walking by, and I felt helpless. And many just trying to figure out what can I do and uh, to make things happen. And a good friend of mine, I worked in an open pit mine and a good friend of mine came in one day and he said, my brother heard this buck make this sound. And he pinched his nose and made a little noise. I said, you're kidding. He said, I never heard a deer do that. He said, me either. Nobody had. And, uh, and I said, were you sure? Is he sure the buck made that sound? He said, he's sure. He said, it was standing right under it. And he watched him do it. And uh, by golly, it's like, well, I, you know, I'm going to try that. So I pinched my nose and practiced. And he said, yeah, that's similar. That's kind of what he said. And it wasn't but a week or two later, I had a nice six-point buck traveling past me at about 70 yards just on a mission. And, I mean, there was no chance for me to get a shot. And that deer was on a mission. So I pinched my nose and made the sound and the buck stopped and I pinched my nose and made the sound again. He walked up 20 yard broadside. I missed the deer. I shot under him, but it, and it was a six pointer, a giant six pointer back in the day. Mm -hmm. It was a trophy for sure. And, uh, I missed that deer, but it just, it just lit a fire in me. Like there's something 
big to this. And for the next several years, only he and I and his brother basically did the grunting with our voice and we started having consistent success, fooling deer, making them come to us. In the in late or about 1979 or 80, I started tinkering with uh, Bill Harper, the owner of Loman. He had invited me out to do some guiding for him for turkey hunters. And he asked me one day, he said, what deer call do you, do you call deer? And I said, yes. He goes, what call do you use, the bleat or the snort? And I said, neither. I use a grunt. And he, and he had no idea what it was, never heard of it. I showed him. He, we went into his shop and, and, and basically said, can you take these parts and recreate this? And we worked on, we took a modified duck call, what we did, and turned it into a grunt deer call. And that and was the that first point, one. Crazy. It just went crazy. I mean, uh, a couple other game call companies, not, excuse me, uh, Haydale and Night and Hale jumped on it within a year or so. And once they jumped on, it added some validity to our claim that you can call deer. Because up to that point, regardless of what anybody says, the only sound a deer made was a bleep or a snort. And you, they, everybody shied away from the snort. And most people weren't even didn't even believe in the bleak call. I mean, very few people even, even though they were out there, <laughs> it was used more in Alaska to hunt certain Sitka deer or whatever the deer they have up there more than it was in the States. So when you start talking grunting, um, it was, it was new to everybody. And uh, uh, it was amazing because I started doing seminars as a very young man started going to do bow hunting seminars and I would get down to the end of the seminar. I said, fellas, here's a secret I'm going to share with you that if you'll use it, you will kill more deer and you will see and kill more bucks. And I blew that call. And I swear to the first seminar I did was with Missouri bow hunters, probably 300 men in the audience, 200 of them were laying on the ground laughing when I blew the call. I had men come up to me after the seminar and look at me and say, kid, you don't know nothing about whitetails. They don't like that. I ain't never, I've hunted deer 50 years and never heard that sound. I said, okay, whatever. I'm not going to argue with you because I, all I cared about was Brad Harris killing deer, and that's what I was doing. Uh, so it took some time. It took some articles. It took people to say, I'll try it. It took competition from other companies to elevate it to where people say, well, I'm going to try this. And even though they, many guys would buy the call and then be scared to death to use it in the woods. That happens to this day. Um, it's amazing. But I believe that it's no doubt the most, uh, you know, I, I would think far as success goes, I don't think there's ever been a tool ever designed that, consistently pulls in deer as that grunt deer call has. I agree with you. And what's interesting about that is you, you made uh, a, a point of it. Back then, those were still the days before quality deer management, before people were holding up, before people were passing up those six-pointers. Um, so we didn't, and before video, so like now there's a gazillion videos uh, uh, showing bucks grunting, different types of grunts. Um, you know, I wasn't quite to the, I hunted a little bit. I was still pretty young back then. Um, did, had not seen it myself, but have, do you think that now that we're 40 years past that invention for, for modern deer hunting, has it made deer more wary? Because now we are hunting older deer and, um, does it take, I mean, I'm sure back then nobody was using it. But now you go out on public land, everybody has a grunt call. Everybody's doing something. They have all different calls, bleats and grunts sure. and rattling antlers and all sorts of other things. Has it conditioned deer not to respond? No, not at all. Matter of fact, it, it, we are, say we, hunters that, I'm going to say educated hunters that are thinking, uh, realize that it's, it's basically time-oriented, rut-oriented. Uh, the, the more intense things are rut via the rut, um, uh, the more, uh, aggressive deer get, uh, when, when, because of that rut, that the calls even work better. I mean, and we are learning and we have learned when that timing is doesn't mean, and I've called deer in, in April bucks in, in April with, you know, just a little bit of growth on their head while I'm turkey. Cause I grunted every deer I see that isn't going to give me a shot or 
even when I'm watching in the summertime, I grunt. doesn't hurt a thing. And times they'll turn and walk right to you regardless what season it is. But when you start adding that ele element of rut and aggression and dominance, it just it's just better. I have not seen it where it there's some years, yes, I it seems like every buck I grunt to comes to me. And there's other years that one out of six come to me. And it's all basically mood and, and style. What's going on at that particular time has nothing to do with the presentation of the call for the most part. It's just the mood of the deer. Some days they're in the right mood and some days they're not. So uh, but it's still very, very deadly. And the bottom line is when you're sitting in a stand and you see a buck that you can't shoot because of distance or whatever, what do you got to lose? And secondly, and more importantly, and this is one that still is not utilized near enough today, is I, I look at sitting in a tree stand like sitting in a boat with a fishing rod trying to catch a bass. And I'm in that boat eight hours a day and would it make very little sense not to cast in other words, you get in a boat and you're a lazy person and you only make one cast an hour and reel your lure in and tell me the fish aren't biting. Well, deer hunting the same way. I'm in that tree stand eight, ten hours a day. There's nothing going on. Now, I'm sitting in a good place. I've read the sign. I know the deer are there, but I'm not seeing them. As a fisherman or in that fisherman mentality, I want to make a cast every so often, especially when pre-rut, rut, post-rut, when things are picking up, I want to cast, and I cast that sound out there to nowhere land. And I've killed so many deer and some really good deer doing that. Um, so I'm sitting in a stand. Every I don't look at my watch. Every 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, I grab my little grunt, back, call that way, back, call that way, and sit still and watch. I do that every day as I'm hunting. That casting, that lure is reaching out there and eventually you're going to hook something and bring it in. Most hunters don't do that. You know, um, I was raised to sit there and keep your mouth shut. Don't move. Be quiet. It was the most first couple of deer hunts with my dad. I thought, my gosh, this is, this is torture. There's no fun in this deer hunting. You can't move. You can't breathe. You can't look. Dad was like, sit still, be quiet. Don't move. Listen, sit still. It's like, wow, this is tough sport. And when I got to call and interacting with those deer, it became a much more exciting sport. And I started shooting a lot more deer and a lot of quality deer. And so it just uh, it just keeps going, you know. It just keeps going. Now, you have people abuse it, call way, way too much, or non, you know, um, not natural. In other words, the deer don't just come, just call constantly. And so there's an occasional abuse to that as well as any other call, turkey call or sometimes over call. But you learn as you hunt and realize that casting out a sound, blind calling, uh, calling a little more when you know the the atmosphere warrants it, the the rut, the, the activity level, you, you become a little more aggressive in your calling. You know, so it's common sense. And a lot of hunters have figured it out a lot of hunters never will. That's a great point, and it's something you actually taught me way back then. I don't know if you don't remember that, but you said uh, it's all about taking their temperature, and you said that's about not only deer, but the thing that you say, turkeys especially. Um, and you've learned that, I guess, turkey hunting is probably a good way to learn how to call anything, period, because sure. if you can take their temperature and then figure out what's too much, what's not enough, you can relay that and do it over when you're deer hunting. Amen to that. And 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 turkey hunters quickly, like duck hunters, duck hunters, that's where I learned to call animals was hunting with good duck hunters. They taught me there's a time to be a uh, plead, there's a time to beg, there's a time to be demanding. And they can watch ducks and geese fly, and they can tell by watching them that there's a time to get on them, be aggressive, make them turn, make them come, or there's a time that you better back it off and sweet talk them in. And I watched these duck hunters do that when I was a young kid. It's like, wow, these guys are reading these ducks. And the more they understand what they're seeing and apply their call, the more success they had. And and it was amazing. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm a, I'm a turkey hunter and a whitetail hunter. I generally raised in the Ozarks. I cannot see a big part of the time, the animals I would like to call. 
especially the deer, you can not only see them a lot of times in the hardwood, you can't hear them either. Turkeys will obviously let you know where they're at if they're goblin. But I realized that that same concept applies. There's a time to plead, there's a time to beg, and there's a time to be demanding on all wildlife you call. The difference between deer hunters, turkey hunters, and, and, and say the waterfowl, we can't watch our game a lot of the times until we get them into view. So blind calling and being aggressive and non-aggressive and figuring all that in your head is just nothing but a piece of the puzzle, a piece of that pie that you're trying to, to, to encompass. And so becoming more aggressive and, and, and matching it to the seasons and the atmosphere in the woods, taking the temperature is real critical. It's real simple, but it's real critical. It is. You know, now I might get this wrong because it's been such a long time ago. I know it was either 83 or 84. The first call that I ever used to call in a deer was, I believe it was a Loman call, but it might have been, remember Olt? Old game calls. It was either Loman or Old. It was a squirrel call, and that yeah. was that was the first. I was you know that it you you punch you punch it, and it yes. make that chatter like a squirrel. And I was hunting squirrels, and I look up and there's an eight point buck just standing there in the snow looking at me, and I'm like, wow, yeah. this is pretty cool. Um, well, that's factor there. Never never even thought never even thought something like that happened. Okay, so I'm gonna I guess we're calling that an old school hunting tactic. That makes me feel old. It probably makes you feel older if we're calling calling um an old school hunting tactic the other thing that i learned from you brad is you always seem to me to have basically you're kind of like a a cornerback in the nfl in the fact that you had a short memory in the fact that you would go out i guess you'd call it still hunting um, and hunt deer almost like you're turkey hunting and to me i just thought that was foreign i was like I'm not going to walk through the woods and sit down and have any chance at deer hunting. And I know that you're very good at that. And I think that is probably an art that's been lost today, hasn't it? Oh, there's no doubt. Um, everybody is basically fixed position hunting. Um, huge percentage of people are blind hunters or tree stand hunters over bait. I mean, yeah, they they have no reason possibly uh, to to do that type of steel hunting or aggressive run and gun type of hunting. Um, so it's different times. And, you know, quite frankly, if you're hunting small tracts of private ground, there's, there's no need in it. You know, there's just that technique doesn't work. But I grew up in the southeast Missouri in the Ozarks and hunted the Ozarks, hunted Mingo swamps in southeast Missouri, which is a vast, flat swamp country, no roads, no trails, no nothing. Uh, a lot of deer in there, but very hard to pattern. And you could put up on sign and you could wait. And, but you know, there was no bottlenecks, no funnels to speak of. It's just flat timber swamp. And, and, and again, you get in the Ozark Hill country and, you know, you couldn't just go set one spot, um, uh, and, and be successful all the time. So I learned in the early stage and, I give Baker tree stands a plug here because even though the old timers, a lot of people hated them, I loved them. It was a, one of the greatest inventions I'd ever, ever seen for whitetail hunters, especially mobile whitetail hunters. And I had put that old Baker on my back and still hunt. And I learned a long time ago that you could still hunt regardless of the terrain. But if you had, you know, good vast amount of ground to hunt and cover you could just still hunt and look and i wasn't real good didn't kill i killed very few deer on the move like that i mean i got had close encounters shot a few deer that way but what that really did was put me in the deer by reading the sign i could move and move and hunt and move and hunt until i read that fresh sign the freshest sign i could possibly find made the night before the evening before even as much as that morning if I was hunting throughout the day and I could put myself put up with that Baker tree stand on fresh sign and it gave me an opportunity at more deer. So being mobile, reading the sign, covering ground, hunting fresh, fresh sign, fresh as I could find at that particular moment. Now the next day I'd be in a different spot. I'd be on the ground that didn't pan out. I'm going to the next best spot I can find. And it paid off for me. I mean, taught me a lot, a lot about reading deer, reading sign, where to hunt, where not to hunt. It taught me a lot, and it was fun. It was enjoyable to be mobile. 
I hunt elk that way. I mean, I don't go set on a water hole or, I mean, I go after them. I go and go and go. Now, they're a little different breed of animal because if you catch them during bugle season, they're a little easier to get on than a good whitetail buck. I mean, stalking a whitetail buck in, in public land is tough. But getting on fresh whitetail buck sign on public land or vast amounts of property, uh, once you have confidence in it, it's not so tough. You can do it. Oh, you can definitely do it. And I'm going to tell the story, and you, you remember this. This is in the late 90s. I went hunting with Brad. We're down in Missouri. Uh, Brad was hunting across the line in Kansas. And you went, and I believe his name is Andy Swift, was a videographer for you. And um, this is the first time I was ever quote unquote on camera uh, okay. as the hunter and Brad says yeah I'm going to have you guys go over here you're going to cross this this gate and you're going to walk up in there and you're just going to set up turkey hunting style and I looked at Andy I'm like you got to be kidding me it was it was during gun season and um, we walk in there I don't know how far a couple hundred yards and we set up and, <laughs> and Andy is busting branches he's got that big beta camera and he's setting it up and I'm sitting on the ground, mind you, you know, crisscross style. And I'm like just shaking my head. I said, I cannot believe it's opening day of Missouri's gun season. Brad said he saw some sign in here, thinks there's some good bucks in here. I'm like, whatever. So then I'm sitting there and Andy's busting these branches. And I said, stop what you're doing. And he said, what? I said, don't move. And he said, well, I said, just don't move and don't say anything. And he said, and he's looking the other way. And I just said, I'm really sorry, man. I kerpow. Well, long story short, it's one of the biggest bucks I've ever shot. It was 160 class nine point. And he was standing there about 10 steps away from me. And I shot him like tur <laughs> turkey hunting style. So we get the buck. I'm just like beside myself happy. Drive back to camp. And there Brad is sitting with, I can't remember, a 16 point non-typical that you shot with your bow that morning. It was, it was one of the greatest, and it was all because you had scouted this land, knew that deer were in there. But in my mind, I'm like, there's not a stand here. There's not a tree stand. I'm not 20 feet up in the air, but you knew that property. Yeah, that was a good bottleneck right there. Um, it was real rough timber on both sides with uh, strip pits. Yep. And it, there's, so, there's such few places that they could cross without, you know, swimming the pit. You know, and so that particular spot was a little bottleneck. It was a nice little open field, yep. but it, it caught everything that came across. So uh, about every deer in the area, if they were if they were moving, eventually they're gonna come through there. And and I knew that if you all got set up in there, there was a chance you'd see a see a good deer. And I knew several good deer lived in that area. And that particular morning, I, I, was, I believe it was the fifteenth of uh, November, September. November. Fifteenth of November. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, that has been a really good day in the life of Brad Harrison hunting over the years. You know, um, I don't know why. Uh, it's just a good day for, you know, on the average, not every year by far, but I can look back on some of the best hunts I've had that day with you and I killing two really super bucks. That buck, I think yours was in the low 160s, yep. I believe. Yours was like 180, I think. Yeah, mine was 176. Wow. And, and he got in on video that morning. And, um, you know, we come back and it's like, hey, this is a good day. It worked for both of us. And, uh, you know, that's what makes deer hunting so much fun. I mean, I grunted and rattled mine in. That, that that's was the right. Yeah, I do remember I that. I horns and grabbed the grunt through a couple of loud grunts, and I could hear the deer running off the hill. I couldn't see it. And I told Taylor, the camera, yep. I said, turn the camera coming. I didn't know what it was. I knew I was hunting some big deer sign. And here comes this giant runner right down the hill. He stops under me 18 steps. So um, your hunt, you set in the right place. And fortunately, you kept your eyes open because that, you know, the movement of getting the camera set up has ruined more than one good hunt in my lifetime. And you were able to see the deer make it happen. And mine was, hey, beat some horns together, throw a couple grunts, see what happens. And it panned out for both of us. Oh, it totally did. So, you know, Today, do you still, I know you still, you hunt like that for deer, but um, are some of those other tactics that we used to use back in the day, like deer drives or pushes or, or anything like that, do, are those still employed or not so much anymore? They are, and, and you know, they, and they're very successful. That'll never change, especially if they're uh, 
planned well and people understand. Uh, they not only use the the you know movement of other hunters to to make deer do things. They also use their scent, uh, their approach. I mean, there's a lot to it. And the guys that are real good at, especially a lot of northern hunters and 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 even our Midwest guys that hunt big tracts of ground. Uh, understand those and, and employ those tactics and still work well. It's getting much more difficult. I mean, obviously we have a lot more hunters in the woods today than we did in the 60s and 70s. And, um, you know, ground obviously has been bought up and broke. You know, a lot of tracks have been cut up and it's changing the whole face of whitetail hunting. And, and, and obviously the baiting and the blinds and the stationary stuff is in food plots and trophy. It's just, change it completely but those tactics still work and you don't have to have a huge piece of ground but there's certain places where bucks hole up and you have a hard time getting to them and a well-organized little push and i always use pushes more than i said drive right i use my scent and and other other hunters to push deer move deer to a certain direction versus trying to drive them through but both still work they're, they're still great tactics if you can find the right place to do it Exactly. Now, what about, let me, let me touch on that point that you made. And I'm saying this from a community standpoint, not, I'm not pointing out anybody individually. Have we become a bunch of lightweights in the deer hunting industry or not the industry? Have, have, have deer hunters become lightweights when it comes to really learning, knowing deer and being able to kill them? There's no doubt about that. And it's not, a, I'm like you, I'm not bashing even. It's just the times. It's just what's happened. Um, yeah, the older, older structured, older generation hunters before game cameras, before corn piles, before blinds, you know, pop up portable blind. Uh, guys prior to that that learned to hunt had to do a little different type of hunting. And the numbers of deer weren't as great as far as numbers, sheer numbers. And that makes a big difference on obvious success, success, whether it's calling success or harvesting or killing success makes a big difference. So you had to, you had to learn a little more about your area. You had to learn a good bit more about scouting, reading sign, because you didn't have no cameras telling you there's a buck walks through here and he walks through here twice a day or once a day or once a week. And he comes down this trail and, you know, he stops here to eat or, you know, it's definitely changed. Is it wrong? I'm not saying it's wrong. I kind of feel bad uh, for some guys that, and some hunters that their whole life is wrapped around dumping piles of corn, sitting in a blind or a stand. That, that's their whole deer hunting world. They love it. It's great for them. But I can, you know, I know they've missed out on a huge amount of adventure and knowledge of going out and, going to new spots and having to figure them out and do it all on your own and make those mistakes and enjoy the, the, the rush when you are successful. Um, so yeah, it's changed a lot. Matt. Okay. We're going to take a quick break to thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of deer talk. Now podcast is brought to you by muddy outdoors and the new merge cellular trail camera. Featuring simple, easy-to-use cellular activation with quick-scan QR setup, the Merge Cell Cam features 26 megapixels, updated ultra-fast trigger speeds, four image resolutions, 80-foot detection and IR range, burst mode, and an SD card slot that takes up to 32 gigabyte cards. It operates on eight AA batteries and has an external power jack for solar battery pack that's sold separately. Check them out at your local sporting goods retailer or visit GoMuddy.com. On my bucket list, which we were supposed to do 25 years ago, is I've always wanted to go rabbit hunting with you. Um, oh, my. <laughs> and I know if you don't know Brad, he does it all. I mean, you won the NRA all-around championship in 2001 as far as calling, but he, he duck hunts, he deer hunts, he turkey hunts, he hunts rabbits, he hunts squirrels. What, you know, you talk about the maybe, I don't know if it's the prototypical deer hunter now who is, you know, sitting in a stand and hunting over a plot or a blind, or I mean a corn pile or whatever. If you had a young hunter, and I know you do teach a lot of young hunters, 
outside of whitetails and I'll take elk off the table, what would you recommend would be the best teacher to make you a better hunter as far as some of these other species? Very simple. The very best teacher I've ever seen in the wild is squirrels, hunting squirrels. Um, I've been a squirrel hunter since I was a little bitty boy. A lot of people will laugh and, and oh, it's a tree rat, la-di-da. And yeah, I've got them in my backyard eating out of the bird feeder. Well, I'm not talking about those squirrels. I'm talking about wild squirrels in the wild, not in the state park and not in your backyard. Go out into the woods and search out and bag a limit of squirrels on a regular basis. It will teach you more about hunting than any other animal I know. The best Hunters, I know personally, you'll never read about, you'll never see them in Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine. You'll never, the best hunters that I know, and I'm talking hunters and woodsmen, learn the squirrel hunt. I That's agree. where they learn. Yep. And just take it for instance, if you go out, look for squirrels, you're gonna, you gotta search. You gotta learn to sneak and be stealthy. You gotta slip around. You gotta, watch so it's sharp you got to look for that movement you got to look for that little bit of a tail or a little bit of an ear sticking out in that tree so you have to sharpen your eyes so you're listening you're listening for that squirrel to go from limb to limb you're listening for that droplet of water or dew coming off a, a limb that's shaking you're listening for the squirrel to cut a hickory nut or an acorn or chewing on bark you're listening so it sharpens your stealth, your skills of sneaking and spotting, it sharpens your eyes, sharpens your ears. And then when you want to shoot a squirrel, and I found years ago, my brothers and I all hunted with 22 rifles and you shot headshots only. So in order to hunt with a 22 rifle and shoot headshots only, you gotta be patient and you gotta learn to shoot. That little squirrel will give you everything necessary to teach you to become a woodsman and a hunter. There's no doubt about it. And you can do it on a long season. You can go on a lot of squirrel hunt and you can sharpen your skills as you go. To this day, when late July and August hit, I'm squirrel hunting. And I do it because I love to squirrel hunt. There's a huge challenge to be successful uh, on a consistent basis, but it sharpens my skill. I get in the woods after turkey season, I start fishing and I don't hunt very much. By the time midsummer comes around, I get in the woods. It's like, I feel like I'm, I got two left feet. Well, I don't want to go elk hunting in September with two left feet. So I go to the woods in the summer and sharpen my eyes, my ears, and my stealth mode, whatever that means. But I use those little squirrels to kind of get me back in tune with the wilds. So and when I get to September in elk country, I'm not two left feet. I'm, 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 I'm kind of sharpening my skills and that's very important when that's your first big hunt of the fall. I agree with you hundred percent. And I said that to somebody had to be 20 years ago. They asked me the same question and I said, you haven't hunted. You'll know how good of a hunter hunter you are when you've hunted a hunted squirrel population. And that's, that, right. that's the biggest thing. And they're great eating. Uh, they put me through college. Uh, they are. Squirrels and rabbits are great eating. No, I'm glad, I'm glad you shared that story because I think it's something that's lost today that um, small game hunting in general just is, I know some people do it, but it's not like when we grew up, it's not as, we, we didn't have deer. We had, we had rabbits and squirrels and that's how we learned how to hunt. And now, now deer start coming around. Now this is fun and we can start uh, hunting something bigger. I want to get to one more topic here, Brad, before we let you go. I wish I could talk to you for a couple hours on this stuff because it's been a while. But um, let's talk about, um, uh, we talked about calling, like with uh, uh, grunt calls, and you say, you know, take the temperature and don't be afraid to call. What about rattling and, and decoy usage? Um, has that changed at all, or do those, uh, I guess, tenants still hold true? It, the, the rattling is still super successful. I'm super, it, it, it'll always be that way. The, the, you know, the deer population boom in the late eighties and nineties just basically solidified that technique. You have more bucks, there's more competition and rattling fits right in. It goes back to the same way with the grunt, but the rattling even 
even though I can remember in the mid seventies, I read articles about these Texas hunters rattling deer. And I would, I would just scoff at it. And, you know, it's like that don't work here in the Ozarks, you know, cause I tried it once. I took my little, little tiny rack out and I clinked them together, reluctantly put it down, no bucks. It don't work in Missouri. It only worked in Texas. That was my mentality. Now, I'm an idiot. You know, I just wasn't thinking in the game. But the calling, when the grunt came along and I realized that I, I can manipulate Ozark bucks, it's like maybe this rattling thing, maybe I didn't give it a shot. And so I started giving it a shot. And next thing you know, I'm rattling in bucks. Now, I throw the combination of the rattle and grunt together and it even was even better, you know. Um, so, you know, I had to learn. I had to drop all those, you know, uh, things that history told me to be quiet, not make noise. I had, I had to learn, relearn to adjust and be more aggressive. And so the rattling just became a part of that. Now, and it's still successful today. The key is timing. Now you go out and take a big, and I, I rattle with big, I learned a long time ago because I hunt an older age structure buck. I used bigger, heavier antlers than I ever used when I was a kid growing up. Number one, I didn't have any. And uh, number two, didn't realize. But now I use a heavy set of antlers uh, to rattle with. I think it makes a big difference in, you know, you still call in spikes and four points, but I've seen it since I started using heavy antlers, I've seen more mature bucks, okay? Don't know why, it just happens. That's just me, it works for me. Um, I realize that interacting at that specific time when bucks are active is great. If you go out with a big set of handlers in, in September and crash them together, you're probably not gonna see anything. It's unnatural to go out with the same little set of, same set of handlers and tickle them a little bit, spar like deer do. It's like an arm wrestling match. I'm not mad at you, hey, there's my buddy. You go up and you tickle your horns, Deer will come to it. They're curious. So you start there, but then you proceed into the season when the rut gets going, the bucks get more aggressive. They get they get uh, very possessive. Get, many become very dominant. Then you start cracking those horns a little harder. So rattling is that progression. You learn and you read the sign, read the times, read the deer, read the mood they're in, and rattle to that, and you'll be successful. And it still works great today. Now, one thing I've learned about decoys, I've never been a big fan. I scare too many deer with decoys. That's me. There's guys out there that'll, that swear by them. I'm proud of you. That's great. But you'll never make me believe that I need to pack that thing in the woods most of the time. There is an occasional difference. If you have a buck really scouted hard in a big, vast, wide open area and you can't do nothing else with it, that decoy might be the key. But in the Ozarks, in tight cover, I put decoys up many times, and all it's ever done is caused me problems most of the time. Blowing does. Just do not like it. Walk around it. Stay around there for 30, 40 minutes, stomping and blowing. Bucks the same way. Look at it and get leery. It's probably more the terrain that I use it in and where I hunt. But I'm not a big fan of it. And I don't think that's going to change. There's guys in certain situations and bucks in the certain right mood at the perfect time. The decoy is great. But I scare too many deer for me, for Brad Harris, to be comfortable. So I don't use them very often. Kind of like, tur kind of like turkeys. And it, that, that, it, it depends upon where you're hunting with them. I know that some places it's fantastic. Uh, they come running into them in other places. I won't put one out. I'd rather have that turkey hunt for me and I could kill him because by the time he finds where that sound's coming from, he's usually within shotgun range. Quite frankly, that's exactly right. I mean, tight cover, what's the use? You know, if you're in timber, what's the use? They're not going to see it till they're probably within gun range. But there's certain field situations. Uh, obviously, people are reaping turkeys today. I've done it myself. It's unbelievably exciting. Not much of a hunt, in my opinion, but unbelievably exciting. Um, and I've had great success with it. Do I use decoy? Not near as much today on turkeys as I did back in the day. The reason I did it back in the day was to have better video. You know, once you had a turkey in close, you hooked yep. the decoy, we could, and that was what people wanted to see. As far as killing goes, 
he gets in the ring, I'm gonna kill him. I don't care. You know, now I'm not worried about video or impressing somebody. I'm ready to put my tag on him and take him to the house. And I know you can do that quite well. I know you can you can release the arrow and drop the trigger like no one else. Well, Brad, <laughs> thank you so much. Like I said, I wish we could go on for a couple more hours, but um, we're probably gonna have to have you back in that case. Well, I'd love to come back and. I, I'm, I'm waiting, Dan. I hope you are. I'm waiting for the next new exciting thing to come to hunters out there. I haven't seen anything new and exciting in a long time. I've been very blessed to be involved with seeing some new innovations as I grew. And so I'm kind of waiting. I'm waiting for something new. What's, what's the next hottest thing out there? Maybe you already know. I haven't seen it yet, but I'll be watching. I haven't seen it yet, but um, we'll, we're going to keep you in, in the loop on that. But I'm, I'm sure it's coming. It's coming probably huh. pretty soon. All right, Brad Harris, thank you very much for joining us. Um, again, I am Dan Schmidt. This is Deer Talk Now. Please like and subscribe to wherever you're listening or watching this podcast, and we will bring you another one next week. This episode is brought to you by Drop Tine Spirits and their premium 12-point bourbon whiskey. The story of Drop Tine's finest bourbon starts with being double barrel aged. What this means is they first aged the bourbon in new charred oak barrels in America's heartland, then send it to California to be finished in the salt air of the Pacific in the finest brandy barrels. Finishing their bourbon in brandy barrels was the choice of many trials to find flavors as unique as the drop time deer. They wanted a bourbon that is not only warm to the palate, but it would sip smoothly and leave notes of fruit behind. They found the perfect brandy barrels in the Russian River Valley near Sonoma, California, and what they created is a bourbon whiskey that exhibits a sweet, floral, almost honey-like aroma balanced by caramel, toasted wood, brown sugar, and toffee. 12 Point Bourbon is only available online. To get a taste for yourself after the hunt, visit droptime.com. Deer Talk Now is also brought to you by HuntStand and the new HuntStand Pro app. Let me tell you, I've been using the HuntStand app for a couple seasons now, and I can honestly say it has changed the way I hunt. There's no more guessing on wind direction, property lines, and stand locations. The app takes my hunting to precise new levels that help me be more successful. The new HuntStand Pro app unlocks unlimited property data on a nationwide basis, including detailed property boundaries throughout the United States and most of Canada, including property owners' names in the United States with detailed ownership information. You can also access detailed public land maps and search for properties on a county, state, or province level. There are so many features that also help you dial in on the best spots based on weather conditions. For more information, visit the App Store or log on to HuntStand.com. This podcast is brought to you by Cuddyback Cameras. I'm going to tell you guys I've known Mark Cuddyback personally for over 20 years, and I've been using those cameras for over 18 years on Deer and Deer Hunting TV. The recent technology in the past few years has absolutely blown me away. And for those of you who don't have great cell coverage where you hunt, Cuddyback's ability to daisy chain from one camera to another camera with new Cuddylink technology is an absolute lifesaver. With the ability to connect 24 cameras, I place one home base camera at the edge of my property, swap that card out just once a month, and I get a look at all the activity on my entire property. My deer stay unpressured and the conditions are prime for opening day of bow season. For those of you who have the luxury of cell service, check out the new Cuddyback Tracks technology. This is game changing. For more information, go to Cuddyback.com. Deer Talk is also brought to you by Traditions Firearms, a family owned business and inventor of the new Nitro Fire muzzle loader. When owner and president Tom Hall and his daughter Allison first showed me the Nitro Fire system, I was immediately impressed that it is not only more convenient than conventional muzzle loaders, but it is safer. The ability to quickly remove the powder charge is a big deal, such as when crossing a fence, climbing into or out of a tree stand, transporting your rifle in a truck or an ATV, or when hiking rough hills, wading creeks, or plunging through swamps. I've used the Nitro Fire on numerous deer and deer hunting TV hunts over the past two years, and I find it safe, accurate, and very dependable. The gun is available in numerous configurations. To learn more, visit traditionsfirearms.com.
The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Apex Outdoor Rewards. Hit record and win rewards. Enter the Apex Whitetail Challenge in your state for your opportunity to win big cash. Enter today and get a 4K camera absolutely free. That's a $300 value absolutely free. There are some serious rewards here, guys, so be sure to enter in your state. Who would have thought your next buck could be putting money in your pocket? Reserve your spot today at apexoutdoorrewards.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Full Range Mounting Systems. These mounting systems are a great way to manage all of your mounts in a stylish and organized manner. We are using their pedestal mount here on the podcast set for two shoulder mounts and it looks just awesome. Be sure to check out all their mounting solutions at fullrangesystems.com. And finally, Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Hey, if you've watched me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, you know that I'm an equal opportunity bow hunter. And for most of the past decade, that has also included crossbows. In fact, I shot my first crossbow deer with a 10 point over 12 years ago. And to say that I've been impressed with their technology is an understatement. This year, I'm shooting the new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. It is light, compact, and includes the revolutionary AccuSlide cocking and decocking technology. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.